Yes, good afternoon. This is Ariel Davidoff uh, for FS Club uh, in based in Zurich. I am very happy to welcome you all, at least in Zurich. It's a sunny afternoon so that we can take you away from the sun into something knowledgeable to brighten you up. Uh, we, speak to the about, we speak today about the UK and Swiss stock listings, advantages and disadvantages versus the European Union. Um, before I introduce the speakers, I would like, well, you know who I am, maybe we can skip that slide, but I would like to thank the sponsors. Without their help, we could not do this, and as you see, they come from a wide range of fields, and they also allow us to have various uh, themes which we can discuss for your benefit. Now, uh, without further ado, I would like um, to introduce you to uh, Matthias Müller, which is first on my screen from BX Swiss. Uh, perhaps we can have the next slide. Thank you so much. Uh, he's a member of the executive board of BX Swiss. That's one of the two Swiss stock exchanges. I will just give you afterwards a little bit more time to talk about yourself. And we have Mark Studdard, the head of UK primary market and the head of AIM. Uh, that's the UK stock exchange of London stock exchange. Welcome to you both. I'm very happy that you could free yourselves up this afternoon. Can we have the first question, please? Because then we dive into the, the whole thing immediately. I thought for the audience, it's maybe of interest to first understand uh, the, basic, the basics of each of these markets, the UK and Switzerland. And as we are two Swiss on the call, I thought we should give uh, the Mark the first word to discuss the UK perspective. So from a UK perspective, could you maybe tell us or our viewers how uh, did the UK stock market uh, perform with regards to listings in the, in the short term? It, where does it stand today? And what's your, what's your outlook for the next six to 12 months, if you please? Well, good afternoon, everyone. And, and Ariel, thank you for the introduction. I mean, it is, it's an extraordinary time to be, to be speaking. Um, the, um, so in terms of the recent past, obviously, um, you know, we've recently been through you know, the worst of the pandemic. Hopefully that's sort of behind us. But I think that's an important starting and a reference point. So from a, uh, a UK capital markets and a London Stock Exchange perspective, over the last two years, a hundred billion pounds has been raised. And, and that's an important context because actually, if we look at the last two years, they were split into quite distinct phases. The pandemic hit and um, yeah, the, the big focus both by companies and investors was that existing listed companies, both on AIM, our growth market, and uh, larger issuers on our main market, went back to their investors to raise further capital. Some of that was obviously sort of rescue and balance sheet uh, building and repair. But actually also companies were raising capital, recognizing that there would be opportunities that came out of the pandemic. And it's easy to or easy to forget that, that actually 18 months ago, um, we the, the concept of a, um, a completely virtual IPO roadshow would, would, would have been unheard of. So we started the first half of 2020 with companies on the market raising further capital. And then in the summer of 2020, we started to see the first batch of new companies doing their IPOs and really testing this whole virtual IPO roadshow process. Um, and then last year, having you know, seen that, that that worked very well, we saw um, you know, a real increase in the number of IPOs. So last year we had 126 IPOs in London. And what, what was very rewarding for me from that was that actually those IPOs were very evenly spread. So half of those were on AIM, our growth market, the other half were on our main market. So there wasn't a concentration just in smaller or larger companies, they were very evenly spread, as I say. They were also spread across sectors. So at the, the beginning of last year, we saw a very strong appetite from investors for growth and, inter and technology and, and internet related stocks. We also saw a big increase, as you might expect, in healthcare related issuers. So from only having, I think, two healthcare IPOs in 2020, last year we had 14 healthcare IPOs. So we saw real momentum in that sector. I think the other trend that we are increasingly seeing is a real 
shift towards um, companies that are involved in the transition to a green economy. So we saw an increased number of um, green and um, and innovative uh, green economy businesses. But then the rest of of the IPOs was was split, split across sectors and regions. Um, we saw a, a very good um, uh, concentration of UK private equity exits, and I mentioned that because, of course, the relationship between private equity and the private markets and the public markets is very symbiotic. We also last year saw a good flow of international businesses, some large European companies, but actually our most active market um, for IPOs was, was North America, and we may come on to talk about that a little bit later. So we've seen very dynamic markets. We saw the further capital raising um, activity continue. So you know, last year, I think there were about two and a half times more transactions by number in London than the kind of closest you know, other European exchange. But, but also the big trend last year for the UK capital markets is you know, we saw a lot of regulatory reform. So many of you on the call will be familiar with the UK government commissioning the Lord Hill to, to uh, look at the whole listing regime. So, you know, at the end of 2020, there were two big reviews. There was the Hill Review and there was the Khalifa Review that focused on, um, on fintech specifically. And then last year, we saw you know, a number of further consultations that came out of the Hill Review, looking at the prospectus regime um, in the UK, looking at the listing regime and some of the key components there, such as the use of dual class shares in London, reducing the free float from 25% to 10% for the main market, for the first time introducing a minimum market capitalization or value for smaller companies on the main market of 30 million. And we continue to, to expect and to see a continued package of regulatory reform sort of continue this year and following years. So I think that also was an important backdrop because um, it's, I think, created a much more founder-friendly um, you know, sort of environment and perception of, of the UK capital markets, with about 25% of UK um, listings being founder-led. So a lot going on in the, in the markets, um, and I think you know, over the last decade or two decades, we've seen a lot of conversation about you know, the juxtaposition between public markets and private markets and the ever increasing depth of private markets. But I think globally, the last two years have really shown the vibrancy and the importance of having active public markets. So that's an overview, but hopefully there are some themes that come out of that, uh, Ariel and Matthias, that we can talk about in a little bit more detail over the rest of the call. Thank you so much, dear Mark. I would like uh, to change the slide and ask the same question um, to Mat Matthias. Maybe just, uh, I found out just before we started the call um, that the Swiss Stock Exchange is about half the size of uh, the UK Stock Exchange, but so it's still a large exchange compared compared to other exchanges on the continent. But mm -hmm. now the floor is yours, Matthias. Yeah, the, the Stock Exchange is, is certainly the, the different in, in size, but also, um, you know, for over 40% of that uh, market cap is uh, uh, derives uh, of the three largest uh, companies uh, on, on the stock exchange, Ro Roche, Novartis, um, and Nestle, uh, of course, so it's a little, little bit different. Uh, also, we cannot re really um, uh, keep up with the numbers that Marcus pre presented in, in terms of IPOs, but uh, yeah, of course, uh, last year was a very good IPO uh, year worldwide. Uh, also Switzerland, uh, we had uh, six IPOs uh, and a couple of uh, direct listings. Um, but compared to, to the UK, uh, we, we don't operate any uh, SME uh, gross markets. Uh, so these listings were all in, in the regulated uh, markets. So with, with higher uh, entry barriers for companies, uh, we, we must say, and for, for Swiss perspective, still uh, quite a good number, uh, I must say. Uh, we also saw the, the first uh, SPAC listing in, in, in Switzerland with um, uh, with, uh, the co with the shell company uh, that listed, listed um, it, its shares, uh, it raised uh, over 200 um, million in, in capital uh, from, from investors. So that's, that was a, a first for Switzerland in that sector as well. And uh, coming to recent developments, I think it's also uh, worth to, to note here, 
uh, that that Switzerland uh, knows something that um, that the UK doesn't know. It's an, an issuance tax. Uh, so if you raise a uh, capital in excess of uh, of uh, one million Swiss francs, uh, you have to pay one percent uh, the issuance tax. So the the public uh, voted on the abolishment of that uh, tax in February, and I was really looking forward to that. Uh, with that voting, uh, because uh, we were all looking forward that it, it got finally ab abolished, but it wasn't the case. In fact, uh, it was very surprising. Over 60% of the people voted against the abolishment. So that was a little bit of a bad news um, in the capital market. But uh, coming back to good news, um, I think we saw, we saw an increased uh, focus of post-stock exchanges uh, on, on SMEs in, in Switzerland. Uh, SIX launched a, a new segment uh, called Sparks uh, with lower entry barriers um, for, for SMEs and also B BX, we, we introduced an innovative uh, fee model where now we, we are sharing 20% of, of the trading revenues with our listed companies. Uh, we also introduced uh, visibility packages uh, for SMEs because uh, we noticed that, that SMEs often don't get enough uh, attention uh, in the public here in Switzerland. It's only the the largest 100 com at least the companies are really uh, get a good coverage here in the media so we want to support these uh, these SMEs with, with added visibility and then um yeah of course all, all these measures uh, by both stock exchanges in that sector are very welcome because if you ever want to achieve a trillion dollar a company or more unicorn listings here in Europe, uh, it all starts with startup companies, smaller companies, and all all these uh, Amazons uh, were once smaller companies. And uh, if you can can bring them on on exchange and and um, uh, present them a way to grow um, in in the public markets, uh, then then this is a, is a good good thing to, to to do here in Europe. But we need to do more. Uh, um, in, in all in all over Europe, I would say, but but uh, of course, uh, or my focus is here uh, in, in, in Switzerland. And then um, one one other thing uh, that was quite interesting, uh, we we listed a company um, end of uh, last year that in fact um, issued two types of, of share categories. Um, so they li listed um, a bear, a bear shares, but then they also issued. Um, tokenized regular shares uh, for investors. So they, they, there was a listing uh, with a company that that uh, issued two type of uh, of shares. That was was quite interesting. And then then of course um, Switzerland is doing a lot a lot in in that um, in that area. Um, we um, the, we introduced a new uh, financial market infrastructure uh, last year. It's called the DLT um, trading system. So distributed ledger technology. Um, trading uh, uh, venue, and this is a new category um, here in Switzerland. So you have, you still have, of course, the, the exchange of the the MTFs, of the OTFs, but you also have uh, this uh, specific DLT trading systems. Very interesting, in fact, because DLT trading systems are allowed to, to if they choose so, to onboard um, end clients themselves. So this is really a new thing because as a stock exchange, uh, you normally only onboard, of course. Uh, the professional trading participants uh, uh, or, or issuers, if you if you want, um, and this this is is really new. Also, that the DLT trading system is allowed to to settle the, the trades, um, so that is all in one one license. So that is um, is, is a very interesting uh, development here. Um, also, we um, as as you know, maybe uh, beginning of 2020, we introduced the Swiss, Swiss uh, Financial Market Act. Uh, there were some uh, transitional uh, periods that ended uh, last year. Um, now, for instance, um, one good thing is for the capital markets um, uh, with EU issuers, they can now passport their issuers, uh, their prospectus in to Switzerland. Uh, that was before not possible. Uh, this pass passporting of prospectuses because uh, Switzerland is not not part of the European Union as as UK is uh, is neither now. Yeah. And uh, yeah, that's, I think that gives a good uh, roundup of, 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 of what we did and, and, and where we are. And of course, uh, looking forward to, to new, new listings in, in, in the future. Yeah. Whilst we change the slide to the next question, um, my personal question is, did you, both of you have an opinion this Ukraine situation, um, does it have an influence uh, in, the, in the amount of listings you observe? Maybe I ask first Mark, then Matthias. Yeah, it's it's a really important point. Um, 
I mean, we, we obviously started the year sort of expecting a continuation of the, the good levels of IPOs um, that, that we had last year. Um, what you know, when you get um, a, a global conflict, um, although it's obviously you know regional on one level, but it, you know it's um, it's had an impact globally. Um, it, it's bound to impact uh, deal flow. So you know the, the the biggest challenge when you're trying to uh, price an IPO is is volatility. You know when you're trying to set the price at which the company should be joining the market against a global backdrop of markets that are up. It, or down two or three percent a day, it becomes difficult to price IPOs. So I think so far this year we've had 17 IPOs in London, but they have been, you know, smaller and not raising as much capital. Um, I think the when the conflict first started, um, you know, a lot of transactions that had started were put on on hold or pause. As the weeks have carried on, I think there's a there's a a feeling that that people know to a greater extent what they're dealing with, and so that there feels like there's a bit more pos positivism coming um, back into the market. I think it's unlikely that we'll see a pickup until you know post Easter, um, but but quite possibly prior to the summer, we you know we could see an increase in the number of IPOs. I think inevitably for some of those companies that were preparing for an IPO. You know, they tend to look at doing a dual dual track type of process where they look at either an IPO or potentially, you know, an, an M&A option or you know, a, a CD round of private equity. So undoubtedly, some of the IPO pipeline won't come through, but we are expecting a pickup um, during the rest of this year. Fingers crossed, really. Thank you. And how is it looking on the side of Matthias? Yeah, a similar situation here in Switzerland, of course. Uh, volatility is never good for these uh, these type of markets. Uh, many investors, uh, from what I heard, are on the sidelines. You know, um, they don't really know um, what, what is coming next. So uh, <laughs> that is is a lot of insecurity in, in in the market, and that is of course never good for uh, for evaluation. Um, if you want, shall, shall I also say a few, a couple of words for to stock exchange equivalency? Because I see, see that on. Yeah, that's the next question mm -hmm. after this acquainting. Please, yeah, please. Could you, once you're already speaking, you have the microphone. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, sure. I can I can say a few words about that. You know, as you know, uh, the discussion uh, in, uh, with respect to Switzerland, or the discussion uh, of, of stock exchange equivalency was never really about uh, uh, the equivalent uh, stock um, uh, market regulation here in Switzerland, because um, 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 it's fair to say that uh, I'm, I'm, I'm sure that we have an equi equivalent regulation in place already, but it was uh, uh, used for, as a political uh, um, means for, for to raise uh, pressure uh, on, on, on Switzerland uh, for an institutional framework agreement. And um, so the, the EU originally um, wanted to, to have the equivalency expired in, in June uh, 2019 and then uh, I think Switzerland uh, made a smart move it, it turned the table on, on the EU and then uh, we, we issued uh, some some extra piece of law uh, that actually then uh, for, forbid um, um, the, the, uh, the, the stock exchanges in, in Europe voted to have um, Swiss shares uh, uh, traded and then um, the, 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 the tra trading firms in the EU then uh, still still uh, were able um, to to trade their shares on on on, on in Switzerland, and they uh, actually were forced <laughs> to trade the shares in Switzerland. And so the market uh, share of of, of six in, in the blue chip it, it, it went uh, to to almost a hundred percent, not from formerly like something like sixty five or, or two thirds of of the pie. It went up to a hundred percent temporarily, other and. And then uh, we still don't have uh, equivalency uh, with the EU, but we have it now with, uh, uh, with uh, the UK. And so that changed the situation again. And now it's, uh, I would say, it's back, back to where it was uh, be, be, before. Um, it's, uh, it's roughly one third is, uh, is on, on UK alternative trading venues, uh, MTFs and the likes. And, um, and the other two thirds are, are, are within Switzerland again when it comes to market share. And um, I, I heard that, uh, or, or we know that, that the EU Commission is currently uh, reviewing uh, 
uh, myth here. So there is uh, Article 23. That's the that's the one uh, we we need to look at the, the shared trading obligation. Uh, that's key. So this is this is in in, in review now, and it's uh, very likely that uh, it will, will soon change. And then uh, this um, this extra piece of law uh, that Switzerland issued won't be necessary anymore. Uh, and then uh, then. Uh, so it will will stay the same. So no no, no affection uh, there, but that won't that extra law won't uh, be possible any anymore. But there uh, I would say uh, there were also unwanted uh, side effects um, by that move of, of Switzerland. Uh, there was one case of a, of a European company that was a, a Swiss company that had its um, shares primarily listed in a, in, a, in a EU country. They wanted to come to Switzerland and cross-list their shares here, but uh, in, in fact they weren't allowed to do so by this extra piece of law. So that that uh, that is was was also not not good for uh, for Switzerland, and then um, I'm quite happy that uh, we will soon uh, be can work without that uh, that extra piece of law here. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, regarding stock exchange equivalents, uh, do you have any remarks? Uh, do we have remarks from Mark? Yeah, I think Matthias has, has sort of summarised the situation very, situation very well. Um, I mean, looking at, at, at equivalents, I think you know the big focus has been on sort of secondary market trading. We we faced you know similar situation in the UK with the share trading obligation, and for a number of sort of dual listed um, stocks, you know, for us particularly a lot of dual listed Irish stocks. You know, we we saw um, some of the trading you know mi migrate to um, EU venues. I think, though, from a, a primary markets perspective, you know, whilst we no longer have sort of passporting, the reality is that the um, the regimes in the UK and the rest of the Europe um, are still you know very similar. So, whilst not equivalent in um, legislative terms, in practical terms, you know, they are so. You know, we we haven't seen that have a major impact on dual listings. In fact, you know, of the international companies that dual listed in London last year, you know, a number were European. I think you know the interesting thing is I mentioned earlier. You know, the UK we've used the the, the Brexit um, opportunity to to look at the listing regime and see if there are any areas that need um, updating. And you know, if we look then towards uh, the rest of Europe, you know, the, um, the the Commission I think is proposing an EU listing act that I think they're going to consult on in the third quarter. And we believe that a lot of the things that are likely to be in there are similar to the reforms that um, you know we've been um, considering or, or implementing in the UK. So actually, we expect regimes to continue to move broadly in the same direction. Um, but you know, as Matthias said in his opening remarks, you know, stock exchanges, the ability for um, companies to raise capital, to grow, to fund their growth, you know, are you know, really important. So hopefully, the, the policy objective of supporting growth and uh, you know and um, and European businesses without unnecessary barriers will prevail. Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, both both our countries have a, have a opportunity now. I mean, it's a balancing act. One way you you still want to get have access in, into the EU and uh, and allow your companies to also to do business there to cross list whatever. Um, but but then uh, also we want to have a very market oriented regulation. That is something is is also unique to Switzerland. I, I have to mention is the. Is the self-regulatory um, uh, power that the exchanges have, so we can we can issue a lot of regulation uh, as exchanges. Uh, of course, we need uh, film approval um, uh, to, for for that, but it's a lot. Uh, it's very market oriented. So if you see um, something's coming up, uh, for instance, in in the area of uh, exchange traded products, uh, we did a lot. Uh, uh, both exchanges, uh, and, and uh, suddenly everybody wanted to invest in, in crypto uh, in instruments. Uh, then uh, it was it's fairly easy to um, to implement the new uh, regulation, and then then uh, have have issues on on board. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I think the next question um, is the last question before we let the audience ask us uh, some questions. Um, maybe again first to Mark. Um, who would you say? Who think? 
who should think about listing at AIM or at uh, London Stock Exchange uh, from, from your viewpoint, what are the minimum conditions? And maybe you have one or two companies which are a little bit more uh, known, which you could cite as a quote, as an example. Yeah, I mean, first of all, um, you know, an IPO or a listing is, um, I think we would probably describe it as a bit of a, a minority sport. It's, it's not for every company. It does open, you know, companies to, to greater sort of transparency and disclosure, but, but that's often a massive advantage for businesses. So companies come, often come to the markets not just to raise capital, and I talked a little bit earlier about the ability to access capital through the public markets. Companies often come also to increase their profile, their credibility. You know, over the years that I've been you know, working in the capital markets and within London Stock Exchange, I've been amazed how many companies have said that one of the reasons that they have IPO'd was actually to be able to win contracts that they couldn't as, as a private business. So you know, that credibility and that profile really comes with, with the extra sort of transparency and, and disclosure. In terms of you know, which companies sh should come, and particularly those that should think about an, an overseas listing, you know, what we often find is that you know, companies want to either um, <clears throat> um, attract an investor base that maybe they can't in their home market. And you know, I spoke earlier about the sort of the depth of the inter uh, international and the institutional sort of capital pool in London. So you know, we often find that 40 to 50 percent of a shareholder register of a London listed business can be North American. So you, know, you can stay in in Europe with a London listing without having to go to New York Stock Exchange or or, or Nasdaq to attract North American money. So, you know, looking to that investor base is often, a, you know, a very strong reason. And that's probably one of the reasons that, you know, we had businesses uh, last year like Trustpilot and fixed price Baltic classifieds come from Europe, as well as a number of Israeli businesses. We also saw last year, I mean, particularly from an AIM and a smaller company perspective, a real increase in the number of North American companies. So. You know, they, I mentioned earlier they were often from um, sectors like healthcare, where we saw a lot of investor appetite. And clearly, you know, there's a very active um, uh, market for healthcare businesses in the US, but actually not for smaller companies. So, you know, we saw you know, a good number of sub hundred million pound um, healthcare businesses, A, coming to get institutional capital that might not be available in the domestic market, but also to be listed um, uh, alongside other companies in their peer group by sector and by size. Equally last year, two of our largest companies on to AIM were both gaming businesses. So Devolver Media, Tiny Build, you know, again, both US companies um, and, and sort of 500 million pound plus. So at the larger end of the sort of the AIM or the small cap sort of spectrum. And the reason that they came was to be alongside you know, a number of other gaming businesses listed in London because by being part of a dynamic sector you know that often will drive a greater level of research coverage and liquidity and hopefully then drive valuation so I think it's sort of peer group and sector both by you know uh, industrial sector and by size and it's attracting uh, an investor base that's appropriate for the company it, it's obviously the, or, um, the main drivers. Just two questions. What's the free float requirement and the minimum capital to list? So um, for, for AIM, we, we don't have prescriptive entry requirements. Instead, what we have is a structure based on what we call nominated advisors. And those nominated advisors who are smaller investment banks tend, um, are licensed by London Stock Exchange under the AIM rules to carry out the role of sort of vetting and approving and, and warranting to London Stock Exchange that the company is appropriate for AIM. And so as part of that assessment, they will look at free float, size, track record, rather than setting it out in the rules. The, the reality though is that investors often want to see you know, a third, 25, 30% free float. So they know there's going to be enough liquidity in the aftermarket, in the trading market, because that liquidity gives them the certainty that they want that they can trade in and out um, for the main market 
last year, the free float requirement was reduced from 25% to 10%. So that's helpful, you know, I think particularly for high growth businesses where they've got often, you know, venture capital or, or early stage investors that don't want to force to sell at the point of IPO. But again, incoming investors will often look at the individual business and depending on its size and the sector and the likely liquidity and the profile of the existing investor base will then you know give feedback on where they expect the um the free float to be so even though the rules say 10 percent investors you know may demand a slightly higher free float thank you so much uh, the same question goes to matthias please yeah, you know, also both the, the UK and, and Switzerland, we have uh, both countries have, have very strong uh, private markets. And so, in fact, uh, of course, for an, when it comes to exits, uh, we are both competing uh, with, uh, with private market exits, trade sales. And uh, roughly, I heard once uh, one, one out of 16 uh, exits is an IQ on a stock exchange. So, um, if you can change that ratio, that would be good for the exchanges, of course. <laughs> um, and uh, last year in Switzerland, we have seen uh, IPOs in, uh, from in the range of anything from 15 million to I think for 850 million. So I said that was, was fairly good year, good year last year. And um, you know, on a, on a country level, I think it's uh, it's very important that we create a, a narrative uh, for investors. What do I mean uh, by, by that? Um, you know, let's let's say uh, in Switzerland we were able to attract. Uh, a few listings, couple of listings of successful uh, green tech companies, then, uh, you know, suddenly everybody would uh, would talk about, ah, oh, Switzerland is the, is the venue of choice for green, uh, green tech firms uh, to list, and uh, more and more investors uh, will be aware of, analysts uh, will specialize on that, funds will emerge, you know, the, it will create the whole, the whole ecosystem around it. And so it's very important to have that, uh, that narrative in, in place. And, in the past, uh, I, I would say Switzerland is, uh, is mostly uh, known uh, for its uh, European uh, dominance in the life sciences uh, biotech uh, sector. It's uh, roughly a third of free market cap is, uh, is uh, concentrated here in, 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 in Switzerland. And this, of course, also has to do with the, with the, the good ecosystem around it, uh, with uh, top universities here, uh, big, big pharma uh, firms, uh, as, you, as you know, and uh, a lot of associations very active in the field and, and so on. So, yeah, another another good thing uh, was uh, was uh, um, uh, last year um, uh, Plug and Play um, has now its European uh, headquarters here in in in, ba in Basel, and um, so that will will also help to to uh, to to do more. I, I would say in that in that respect uh, because Basel, uh, of course, very close to life life sciences companies. Uh, and that will help also in the, the startup field, so the early early stage uh, of uh, of companies uh, that then maybe later on uh, can do a listing on, on one of the, the stock exchanges here in Switzerland. Um, as uh, as uh, I have said in in the beginning, not, uh, we, we don't have um, um, growth markets as the EU knows. Uh, it's, uh, both exchanges only operate uh, regulated markets, uh, but but uh, we have. Yeah, also investors have uh, actually the choice of uh, two, two different segments on six. So it's the main uh, market. Uh, it's the, the new um, the new segment for uh, SMEs uh, that uh, six uh, introduced Sparks. Uh, so two segments there. Then, then our SME main market with BX Swiss. And then uh, to complement that offering of the stock exchanges, um, there are also a couple of banks that operate the uh, OTFs, um, and uh, there are like 300 companies. Uh, are, are being traded on, on these OTFs of, of the banks. So it's not, not a stock exchange, it's not an MTF, but it's, a, it's an OTF. And uh, so also um, companies here in Switzerland, they, they do have a choice uh, depending on, on what suits them best, uh, they can choose the venue, venue uh, that, that is best, uh, best for them. Um, yeah. Thank you. I think we go, we turn now to the questions and um, Kenix Lee, he asks basically a, an additional question uh, to what you just answered now. In particular, he asks, when companies list overseas, they always think of the US first. Are there any advantages of listing in the UK or Switzerland over the US? 
Now, I think, Mark, you already answered that a little bit, that actually companies come to UK if they also want to do something with US. Can we very briefly, because I have another two questions, uh, can you reply to that again for Kenneth? Yeah, so I think you know, the driver is often size and sector. You know, the, I mean, the US capital markets are obviously very deep, but you know, really, um, as a result, um, I think com companies often struggle to get any sort of investor focus or visibility or liquidity or analyst coverage below about a billion dollars. So, you know, given that in London we have a more growth market where you know, the, the average you know, market cap at IPO is around 100 million, you know, it, it's, it's a market and, and a whole ecosystem that's designed more to, sort, to support smaller companies, which is why we see you know, flows of North American businesses as well as UK and, and other European businesses um, coming to aid. You know, the, the other obvious thing is litigation risk in the, in the US, the number of class actions, whether they are um, frivolous or, or, or legitimate and you know it's a big distraction particularly from a smaller company for for uh from running their business so i think yeah there are a number of reasons um and they're amongst the main ones yeah and from a swiss viewpoint yeah you know in, in the past uh, we, we didn't see a lot of uh, listings of uh, foreign companies in in switzerland uh, but i think uh, the the focus is rather that that we prevent Swiss companies from having to list uh, abroad. Uh, last year, as you know, uh, on holding uh, the, the shoe uh, company backed by Roger Federer uh, did, did an IPO and, uh, and, and not not here in Switzerland, uh, but they, they listed on the New York Stock Exchange. And uh, of course, there are various reasons uh, for, for that, but it's mostly about the, the, the investors uh, base and, and the valuation. And, uh, and other factors, I mean, uh, they probably uh, pay much more uh, for, for the listing on the exchange than here in Switzerland. But, but uh, if you count, uh, you factor that into the other factors with the higher valuation, uh, still it uh, is, is not the relevant uh, factor for that uh, decision. But it's the investor access and valuation. Thank you so much. I think a question from Bob, Bob McDowell, uh, which, who is, which is relating to this Ukrainian conflict. Um, what impact, if any, is the rise of the commodity prices having on the attraction of listings? I think you already answered that a bit with the Ukraine conflict, but do you have anything to add? Yeah, I mean, it, it's um, the interesting thing is the sort of the short term change in sort of sector focus. You know, I think having moved from you know, a very global market for commodities. People are now looking again a lot more closely at um, commodity security, and you know whether that's you know oil, gas, or even you know the components you know to go into battery technology. So I think you know whereas the global capital flows were just going to you know the least cost producing jurisdictions, people are now thinking actually we also need more security. So we're seeing um, you know, investment into um, you know, commodities businesses that might have been um, you know, less viable pre pre the conflict, uh, and, and have become more viable a because people want a diversity of security, but also because commodity prices have gone up. Thank you, Matthias. What do you think? Yeah, so it could uh, logically really benefit uh, green tech uh, co companies. Uh, I mean, uh, the, 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 the poli politicians here in Switzerland already tried to use the uh, uh, arguments uh, for their own uh, agenda uh, with the Ukrainian conflict uh, uh, the, the, for that. But I, of course, yeah, um, I mean, commodity prices are higher, gas prices are, uh, will be higher or higher, uh, oil prices are raising. Uh, in the US, uh, the, the, the companies uh, that, are, that almost went bust uh, specializing in, in, in the fracking uh, of, of oil, but they, they almost got bust because the, the oil price wasn't at the level where they could uh, sustain their, their business. They, uh, they now made billions in, in the, the situation with, uh, with a higher oil price. Um, also, with the gold price um, is higher, now more mining uh, companies uh, uh, are, are active again, mm -hmm. uh, mining for gold. So that is uh, certainly a big impact of, of these type of companies. And, and in Switzerland, uh, there are many uh, commodity trading firms. Uh, they have uh, their headquarters here. 
uh, the, some of them are listed and uh, yeah, they will see, see uh, the revenues go up for, for sure if they have uh, proper hedges in place. Thank you. Um, I would like to take the last question because we are already nearing the end of our time. So if, you, if I could ask you to be brief, do you think it might be possible that EU sustainable finance disclosure obligations might deter companies from listing in the EU as ESG disclosures would represent an additional cost? That's Kaspar Köchli who asks this question. So ESG uh, legislation about disclosures preventing people from wanting a listing in the EU, but rather preferring UK or Switzerland. What do you think? So, I mean, I'm happy to start with that. I mean, I think the really interesting thing about um, ESG disclosures is that we're seeing them not not just a, being a feature of, capi of public capital markets. You know, the the end owners of capital are more and more conscious of the you know the governance, the green credentials, the social responsibility of both public and private companies. So, you know, we're increasingly seeing and hearing from private equity backed businesses that they are being asked to make disclosures to their private equity backers. So I think this is an area where we are going to see you know, an increased pace of change. But we're also going to see a global convergence of standards. And when actually I think we're going to see more equivalence between private and public companies. And so you know the sort of historic sort of governance situation of it only being public companies that are expected to, to disclose, I think it will become a thing of the past. Yeah. Thank you. And Matthias, closing on the same question. Yeah, I think, you know, ESG disclosure is, is really important for, for larger firms, especially that have uh, a lot of, uh, of um, professionals uh, in, invested, in institutional investors. This is um, more and more not really a, a matter of, of choice or whether to have a nice thing to have, you know, but it's a must have um, more and uh, more. Uh, maybe for micro cap, small cap companies, uh, also depending on what their businesses uh, are, other than I mean, uh, for an investment company, uh, why should they disclose the uh, ESG? You know, it's, uh, that's, that's maybe not, uh, not really meaningful, but apart from that, uh, it, it's, it's more and more important. Eric, can I just make one sort of final observation so really quickly? I mean, the, the other thing is that there's a 14, I think it's a 14% CAGR in the growth rate of capital that's going into ESG related funds. So actually, the weight of money that's going into these businesses, it also makes it attractive for companies to want to disclose and to be part of a, you know, a, a community that can attract that additional funding. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I, I think we see that also at, at, at the Swiss end. Now, I would, I've been nearing already the end. I would like to thank you very much, uh, Matthias and Mark, that you uh, took part in this panel. As you saw, the time goes very fast. I would also like to thank the audience for bearing with us and uh, participating with questions. Uh, as usually, I remind you of the sponsors, which you just saw flick by, and the forthcoming events. And I wish you all a safe time. And uh, please don't forget either to, to list either in the UK or Switzerland. <laughs> and I wish you a nice afternoon. Thank you again. <laughs> See you soon. Thanks a lot for participating. Bye. <laughs>